All good. All righty. What's going on, everyone? We have a very special guest today for today's episode, so make sure you stay until the end. He's one of the first people that I ever started listening to on a regular basis when it came to YouTube or podcasting. Whenever I go for a long run in the morning, I'd be tuning into his content. He's helped thousands of struggling military, law enforcement, and firefighter candidates get to and through the intense tactical assessment and selection programs. I want to welcome retired Navy SEAL, tactical fitness coach, and author, Stu Smith. Stu, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Mission Driven Made podcast today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. Of Appreciate course. It. Of course. And you have a, a lot of accomplishments in your life. Did I miss anything in the intro as far as any of your titles? Um, no, though I'm not retired. I only did eight years in the Navy. So I uh, only spent, you know, not I'm a former SEAL, not a retired SEAL. So former SEAL, got it. It got didn't it. quite have the commitment to pull 20 years of it. It is it's a tough job. So you have to wait to 20 years to have the title of uh, retiring. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. And so starting with the, the Navy SEALs, did you know this is what you wanted to do uh, growing up? No, I uh, did not. Though I will say I, I was in the water a lot when I was a kid. I grew up in Florida, so always played in the water, hunting, fishing, played a lot of sports. Uh, so I was always active, uh, but uh, I never really thought about navy seals um until i was already in the navy well i, you know, I went to the naval academy so you know i went there mainly to be a pilot you know i thought i'd want to be a pilot after i uh graduated high school but things change and uh i got exposed to all opportunities that the navy and marine corps offer and i wound up selecting seals awesome and was it a little bit more secretive back then because i feel like now you see you know advertising in some way shape or form for navy seals all over the place um yeah i mean it was 1987 when i joined so it was a different world um you know cold war was just about to be finished it was probably at the one one of the you know not necessarily the peak of it but it was still hot you know in 87 reagan was president um so uh it was, there was nothing written about it. You know, there was nothing out there. There was no internet, right. you know, and, you know, there's no social media, obviously. And right. so it, it, yeah, nobody really knew about it. I mean, most people, when I said I want to be a Navy SEAL, you know, back in like nine, 89, uh, people still didn't know what it was. So, right. A little bit of a enigma in a way. Right. Yeah. So you're, you're in the Navy, you decide, you want to become a SEAL. Can you kind of dive into what you did to prepare going into BUDS? And can you kind of just give us a brief overview of what BUDS is? Sure, ab absolutely. Um, yeah, as a teenager, you know, I, I went to the Naval Academy. I was ready to play football for Navy. You know, that, that was my goal was to, you know, get a college scholarship, play some football, and then join the military afterwards. I just happened to get accepted in the Naval Academy where it's kind of both. Right. You, right. you can play football and you, you're in the military and you can go be an officer after you graduate. So that was kind of like best of both worlds for me when I first arrived. But then things I realized I was not quite in military shape when I got there and failed my first fitness test when when I got. Oh, there. wow. Then, no way. Yeah, I failed <laughs> sit ups. My first 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 fitness test I ever yeah. took in the military. I failed sit ups and I maxed the second one, though. So. There you I go. Fig I figured it out. <laughs> I figured out. I was like, I got to change something. Um, but no, it, it was, I, I was not, you know, prepared for that to be a seal. You know, I was wanting to play football. So I realized I needed to be a more endurance athlete. So I wound up playing rugby instead of football that, that helped with that transition a little bit. And then there were a lot of players on my team that were also, you know, on that same journey that were older than me. So I got to see what they were doing to prepare for buds, you know, and it was, you know, we, they'd work out in the morning and then they would go to rugby practice. And then on the way back to the, you know, where we lived, uh, they would stop off by the swimming pool and swim for an hour. And then they go eat dinner. Then they study the rest of the night. So I was like, okay, I guess that's what I have to do to make it through and you know one graduate from the academy but two 
you know, get in good enough shape to be able to do what they're doing. And then it was, it was refreshing to see that that paid off for them. You know, they were two years ahead of me making it through SEAL training. And I was like, yeah. okay, you know, kind of validated the process a little bit and took away some of that, the impossibility factor that, you know, I, I had, and a lot of other people have about, am I really ready to do this? So sometimes you have to see it to believe it. Right. Right. Yeah. Definitely. The beginning, I feel like these big goals can kind of feel like a, a pipe dream a little bit. Oh, absolutely. I had a pipe dream. I want to be a professional <laughs> athlete when I was yeah. you know, 16 years old, you know, that I'm very familiar with pipe dreams. So yeah, absolutely. And preparing besides the sit-ups, was there anything else that you found was very challenging for you in, in preparation? Absolutely. Anything having to do with endurance. You know, I, I went in there a strength athlete, power athlete. I was a powerlifting football player in high school. You know, the bench press a truck, you know, deadlift a truck. You know, I was, I was strong. Uh, anything over a hundred yards was long distance, <laughs> you know, having to right. make that, having to make that transition into more of a endurance athlete took a good year to 18 months. I took a good year just to, yeah make the transition then it took another six months to be competitive on a spec ops level so gotcha it, it was a long journey did you doubt yourself at all in the process getting ready to go into buds oh sure yeah absolutely i mean it, i think that's human nature to doubt it but i think that you know if, if you get into a habit and you just continue these habits one day at a time one day at a time and then you have these little moments of validation that occur right. where one you're seeing progress but two you're seeing other people ahead of you succeed uh that makes a huge difference in the journey even though you might be doubting yourself on this long unsexy journey yeah um uh it, it pays off in the end yeah awesome i, I love to hear the humanity in that because it's so easy to look at navy seals and think they are literal superheroes so it's kind of nice to hear that you were human going through the process as well oh, like, like the rest of us <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean it's yeah. it, it, it's a transition that takes some time and you, you gotta you gotta put in the time i tell people that all the time yeah. don't be in a rush to join because just because you're 18 doesn't mean you have to join at 18. I mean, you have right. until 29 years old. So that's a, that's not a window. That's a, that's a barn door to be able to right. join the military. So don't be in a rush, you know, get in good shape first. Otherwise you're just, you know, once again, you're kind of in that pipe dream phase. Right. Really prepared. And since you were in the Naval Academy, did that mean you entered the SEALs in your mid twenties? Is that correct? Yeah, I was 22. 22. Okay. 22. Yep. 22. Gotcha. And something that I've personally given a lot of thought over the last couple of years has been emotional intelligence. Do you think that plays a role in being successful, especially going through buds? 100%. 100%. I, I would say, you know, we started with 120 people in my buds class. Yeah. And I would say probably almost 100 of them were teenagers. Wow. And then when we graduated, we had 28 and we Ooh. had about, we had about four teenagers that graduated. Wow. So uh, that's a, around 80% or so. That's I mean, a, yeah, wow, I mean, maybe yeah, more. It, it was, it was, it was a good class. Um, but you know, it was just one of those things that, um, you, they would, they would fall prey to a lot of things, whether it was negative feedback from the instructors or it was their girlfriend breaks up with them or they're living in a new town in a barracks, you know, with a whole bunch of new people for the first time away from home. And now they're at being asked to perform at a level where they've never, you know, experienced, you know, and all these things just are just like the perfect storm for failure right? Um, for, for many of them. And, you know, I, I think being 22 was very helpful. Yeah, especially the environment that you already were in, you're kind of used to it in a way, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. I, I, four years of Naval Academy was harder than six months of BUDS. Wow. I, I, I will tell people that all the time. I, I just, I did not, Yeah. I didn't like the Academy and I didn't appreciate it while I was there when I'm 
finished and now I appreciate it, you know, for what it was able to do. And I just didn't even know it. You know, I didn't know it was helping me be a better leader. I didn't know it was giving me more resilience to handle stress. Right. You know, that was making others crack. You know, it was like it had, why why are people quitting? It hadn't even gotten hard yet. You know, type of resilience. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And now with you being on the other side of all this, what would you say is one of the largest mistakes you see as far as candidates preparing to get into buds? Uh, I would say one, they go in too early thinking they're ready. Um, and I, I break down tactical fitness. You know, I, I, it's what I write about. I've been writing about yeah. it for, for over 20 years. And I break down tactical fitness into three phases. And the first phase is, and this is what everybody who goes to buds succeeds in. They succeed in getting two buds, right? Which means they pass the fitness test. They meet all the standards. You know, there's no real strength or weakness in a 500 yard swim, a mile and a half run and pull up, push up, sit ups. They meet the standard. They're able to get into buds. However, if you don't spend some time focusing on the events that are going to get you into phase two of that, which means uh, getting through the training, Right. Right. Some of the specifics of getting through the training, which now turns into longer runs in boots on sand, Ooh. you know, four, four mile timed runs every week. You get two mile ocean swims every week with a pair of scuba fins on. You have obstacle courses, you have beach runs, you have, you know, boats on your heads, you got logs on your shoulders. You know, all of those things require a level of preparation that most people neglect. Right. All they do is get two buds. They don't focus on getting through buds. Gotcha. So that's the biggest issue. And then phase three of tactical fitness is you're an active duty operator. You know, wh- whatever job that you're in, now you're post selection or post academy training. And now it's just, you know, you got to maintain all those elements of fitness that, you know, require you to be able to do your job, but as well as, you know, be able to mitigate the stress that's involved with doing a tactical profession that um, sometimes a lot of people neglect. Absolutely. And, and the thing that seems very challenging, at least from an outsider, is when you're going through buds, I feel as though you just get more beat up every day. So these uh, these times that you have to meet or these evolutions would probably get harder as your body gets more beat up. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And the times get faster. So they'll drop every phase that you're in buds, right? They'll drop it a minute, you know, for the timed run, they'll go from 32 to 29, you know, in a couple of phases. And then the time swims, they drop by five minutes every phase. So you go from, you know, a two mile swim in 80 minutes to 75 down to 70. Um, or 85 down to 75. Um, wow. But those are the minimums, right? If you yeah. really want to make it through the training, you can't even think about the minimums. You know, you have to be on that mindset of, I'm either going to win this race or I'm going to be in the top 20%. Because in a school that requires, you know, 20% to graduate and 80% is a, the attrition rate. Right. You need to be flirting with that top 20% all the time. Yeah, there may be something where you struggle in that you have to, you know, remediate and get better at. And maybe you're in the middle 50, but majority of what you do there has to be in that top 20% or yeah, you're not going to make it. Wow. Uh, did you ever get to the point where you had to remediate um, any of the skills or evolutions that you're doing? Um, yeah, you always, you get three chances at just about everything. Yeah. Um, There's one event called drown proofing where they tie your feet together with a rope and then tie your hands behind your back. And then they say, now you're in the pool for the next 30 minutes and a variety of skills from floating and bobbing and swimming and front flips and back flips and diving down to the bottom and picking a mask up with your teeth. (laughs) Oh man! That's the whole test. I just, I just summarized the test for you in 10 seconds, but it's a 30 minute test of that. And it's pretty exhausting. And as I was, I had the mask in my mouth, I was done. And I had to swim over to the side of the pool. And right as I did, 
uh, my rope came undone. And so oh, one no. of those instructors saw it oh, and no. he goes, your ropes came undone before you were finished with the test. You got to do it again. Oh, no. And so it did it again. The next, he got a 10 minute break and the people who failed it had to do it again. And, uh, so yeah, I had an hour's worth of that test, you know, and oh, instead of just 30 minutes, and, yeah, that sucked. So yeah, but you do get a couple of chances to remediate. You know, no matter what the test is. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then have you seen anyone that's looking to become a SEAL? Say they have zero background in not just sports, but fitness. Have you seen that type of individual still be successful? You know, that's a tough one. Um, you know, having an athletic history doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make it through because most people with athletic histories have gotten really good at something. Right. Right. Strength, power, speed, agility. If you're a football player, you know, swimmers are great at endurance, but they anything with gravity, it's they, they there's a corresponding weakness to an athlete going in. And right. so there's there's some time that athlete has to also spend on that weakness. You know, for someone who's not fit at all, will just have to turn all of their weaknesses yeah. into a strength and that it will just take longer time. Now, the closest I can say yes to that answer, to that question, is a couple of times I have seen guys that did not play sports, but they did other things. They rode bikes and they did skateboards. You know, they, they were the skate, skate rats in the neighborhood and, yeah. um, and they, they made it through. But it took them four years of college, specifically preparing for BUDS, not playing sports or anything, but just right. learning to swim, learning to run, learning to do calisthenics, right. lifting weights to work on some strength. It, it was a four year training cycle for the person that was not necessarily into fitness. Gotcha. And I think I remember if this is correct, tell me if I'm wrong. You or Jeff Nichols said, if you could make one athlete that would be successful going to buds, it was a swimmer slash wrestler. Was that it? Yeah. A wrestler that could swim. Gotcha. Yeah. A wrestler that could swim crushed buds. Yeah. Cause there were some that, that were there, you know, that wrestled yeah. and were swimming. Now uh, I did see another one, another athlete that crushed buds was a uh, lacrosse playing cross country runner. Oh, so he okay. did cross country and he played the cross. Okay. Um, so he just had to get decent at swimming too, but he could run like the wind. He was strong and big and even though he was like 215 going into yeah. uh, Buds, he was still running like an 815 mile and a half, which was just, wow. you know, insane at yeah. 215 pounds. You know, he still had his cross country background, even though it was like a freshman, sophomore year in high school or something when he ran cross country. Yeah. And then he did, then he did lacrosse in college. He was always a good runner. So it, it's, it's really kind of unique how, whatever you start off in your world of fitness, yeah. like for me, it was in the eighties, it was bodybuilding and, you yep. know, Arnold Schwarzenegger books and Joe Weider. Um, and then that evolved into powerlifting and football and training like that. So that's kind of like my thing, Yeah, you know, and everything else is a weakness. You know, I have to work really hard at high repetitions and calisthenics and uh, running and swimming. You know, those are things that I have to work at. You know, if I go to the gym, I look at weights, I get stronger. You know, I, I don't even have to look. Yeah. No, I'm joking. But <laughs> um, but it's very easy. It is very right. easy to like stay strong. But, you know, if I don't run for a week, it's like yep. I've never run before. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't live for a week. I come back stronger. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so is the pool or just water in general? Is that kind of the equalizer for most people going in? I would say that that and running running yeah because there is an awful lot of running that yeah is, i mean there's a saying that it's a running man's game out there yeah that's probably created by somebody who doesn't run um but at the same time it, it, it's so much more than just running as well i mean you have to have strength and you know just durability uh you gotta swim well and not just swim but be comfortable in the water yeah. you know dark water scuba diving is freaky um, swimming in the, at night is, is challenging, Ooh. you know, it's just one of those things, open water swims at night. Yeah. 
not the most comfortable thing to do, but you get used to it. And I've, I mean, I've seen people quit right before the, we called it the, our first boogeyman swim. Um, you know, people quit right before they, they go in the water. <laughs> that does seem pretty, pretty terrifying <laughs> going around Coronado at night. I couldn't even imagine being in the ocean at that time. So well, anyway, it's, well, uh, it's a good little challenge and yeah. it's more mental. There's a lot of mental yeah. challenges to it. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I want to switch gears just a, a little bit toward entrepreneurship. Absolutely. When you were transitioning out of the SEAL teams, did you already know what you were going to do and like what type of endeavors you were going to do once you got out? No, I was really wide open. I had to try to find what I wanted to do. Right. And, and I advise this for everybody is, you know, a lot of times that you might not know exactly what you're going to do and you may change your mind two or three times. I, I say that's good. Yeah. Cause if you don't change your mind once or twice, you're not even trying. Right. So, you know, when you're making that transition, yeah, it's nice to have a plan obviously. Yeah. And I had a plan. I was uh, going to go to get some extra school. Um, but then 9-11 happened a few years afterwards. After yeah. I, I got out in 99, 9-11 happened and I considered going back in, but I was pretty banged up. I just had surgery that year from a previous injury and I just had a kid and there was a whole lot of reasons yeah. I was juggling on to go back in. So I decided to do some contracting and it was more security consulting. Yeah. Um, after 9-11 as people were spending a lot of money on trying to be secure. And I linked up with this firm that, um, at, that, that, offered security consulting. And so I was writing and doing some security consulting, traveling. Um, and, uh, it was fun. It was a good couple of years of doing that and that yeah. kind of dried up, but at the same time I, I had the side hustle of working out and writing about it. You know, I, I just, I had a book out and I was doing some online training and I started writing articles for military.com. Um, and then it just started to blossom in that direction um and to a point where i said all right i'm gonna try to make this my full-time gig awesome and um i'd say about 2004 2005 that is uh that's what i did so awesome and uh, what would you say was the biggest attribute that you took away from the military that made you successful in being an entrepreneur hmm Good question. I, you know, I would say that, you know, one thing I learned specific to, I, I guess, my training is that um, your body is 10 times stronger than your mind will let it be. So what I mean by that is, you know, when I was going through hell week, yeah. um, you know, you're just exhausted. You're up for 120 straight hours. You get a nap or two here and there if you win something. Um that was a good indicator that like, okay, I, I can pull an all nighter if I need to, right. If I, if I have a deadline that I need to get done, I can do whatever I can to get that done. Yeah. Regardless of the time it takes to do it. Right. I, if, right. If I have to miss a night's of sleep, I can do that. You know? So I think there was a lot of, uh, there's just a lot of that type of mentality that enabled me to say, screw it, let's do it. <laughs> you, you know, yeah. I can yeah. do this. I yeah. can do this. I just got to put some time into it. That's it. Yeah. I got nothing but time. So let's do it. Awesome. Awesome. And when I used to work for the fire department, a few of my coworkers were retired Navy SEALs or they'd been in for a little bit, maybe not necessarily retired. Mm -hmm. I remember asking one of them, um, if everything that they do in life now, like even going through the fire academy, if that seems easy compared to being in special warfare, <laughs> does it kind of feel like that for you now, you know, going through what you did? Uh, you know, I, I, I have to go back even further that yes, I will say yes. The short answer to that is yes. But, you know, leaving the Naval Academy, the world, the weight of the world was lifted off of my shoulders. Um, and, and I, I talked to some kids that graduate college now, yeah. you know, just, you know, regular college that are going into the military afterwards. And they're like, man, my life is so much easier right now that I just finished college. You know, people, you know, make fun of college students 
because it's you know i don't know why but it's freaking <laughs> hard man yeah <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you're constantly bombarded with to-do lists yeah. and you got to get these done and deadlines and uh, yeah. yeah you know it's not real life i get it but it definitely prepares you and it makes real life a little bit easier when you've actually had to endure some of the, those stresses right even though they're fake stresses i get it um i think it, it prepares you you really well for what's to come no matter what you do you know whether it's an academic job or it's a physical labor job you know the the some of the challenges that you have in college can definitely prepare you for the next step it's kind of like, uh, reminds me of like progressive overload in the gym. Yep. You're, you're used to, you know, something that was so hard. Now you're kind of at the next level. It's kind of like that mentally, if that, that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I agree with that a hundred percent. And uh, Stu, any future plans, um, we'll say as far as all your entrepreneurship that you can share with us in the audience? Um, you know, I'm just going to see where things are, you know, keep moving for me. You know, one thing that I did when I started uh, working out and writing about it is, you know, this was really before people were even buying ebooks, right? So I started selling ebooks online, right? And then that changed my whole business, you know, yeah. because I, I, I could make money in my sleep. You know, people were buying stuff 24 hours a day versus me having to go out and work all the time. Right to make money, you know, it just completely changed. And then social media came instead of having newsletters and email lists. Now, you know, we can pop up, you know, something up on YouTube and yeah. Instagram and do podcasts. And so I, I try to just stay completely open and learning as much as I can about the technologies that are helping entrepreneurs every day, because here's something I truly believe. You know, and, and it's good and bad. You know, I think that everybody is a media company now. You know, I am a media company that sells fitness books. You know, a real estate agent is a media company that sells houses, right? They're going to use YouTube walkthroughs. They're going to use Instagram. They're going to use all these different methodologies that are on social media or websites or email lists that are going to help them make money and, and business. Right. So I think if, if you're not paying attention to the changes, you're quickly going to be uh, not relevant in your, right. in your world. Um, and th that's the biggest key for me. The next yeah. 10 years, you know, I have a positive outlook on the next 10 years and I have some goals, but yeah. they're more just let this thing grow to see what it can do. How much can I automate um, and do it? You know, how much, how many people can I have on my online training program before I fall apart? You right. Know, before, you know, what is that number? I don't know yeah. what that number is because I haven't fallen apart yet. But, <laughs> um, you know, and it's just move from there. But I, I think I'm constantly training people. So I'm constantly coming up with new ideas. Some of those new ideas may be, books they may be ebooks they may be videos in the future but i, I just gotta keep the flow moving so that that's yeah. that's my next 10 years awesome it uh i can kind of relate because for me going into entrepreneurship the technology and social media that was kind of the biggest culture shock for me but <laughs> i just figured i i have to you know learn this this is where everything is going so i could definitely relate to to what you're saying there uh, so this is the last part of the show, and I want to give you the floor for uh, just a few minutes. So if there's someone that is looking to perform at the highest level, whether that's becoming a SEAL or an entrepreneur, whatever it else may be, what are some concrete steps that you can, you can give the listeners uh, to do starting today? Yeah, you know what? I, I wrote an article on the, almost on this topic yesterday. Um, and it has to do with setting goals. Um, and a lot of people, especially when they're making a transition, whether it is out of high school, it is out of college, yeah. it is out of the military, you know, there are forks in the road that occur to all of us at some point in our life. Am I going to go down this direction? 
am I going to go down this direction? And my advice to that is, first of all, what is it that you can't stop thinking about? You know, what is it that's constantly ringing in your head? You know, it's talking to you no matter what. Is it a calling, you know, that, yeah. that you may be having um, to serve or to um or not not doesn't necessarily have to be a service job but it's just something that's interest you so much it's resonating with you all the time go down that road you know no matter how big a goal that is go down that road and and attack it with all that you have but set sub goals along the way you know because you know i tell people all the time a goal isn't a destination you know a goal is a journey A goal is a journey into all the things that you're going to learn along that journey, but the destination never stops because, you know, I got to a goal of doing a passion that I like working out and writing about it, and I made it a business. However, I had to stay on top of things and learn that, hey, there's just something called Facebook. You know, there's something called Instagram. I remember when my daughter says, you know, she's an eighth grader at the time and says, Hey dad, you need an Instagram account. All the kids are going on Instagram now. I'm like, what is Instagram? I just figured out Facebook. (laughs) There's a new one every day. (laughs) You know, so you have, even though you may not want to do it at all, right? You have to push, you have to push through those little barriers of like, man, I don't want to do that. That's stupid. (laughs) It's not, you know, it's where things are going. You have to be smart and listen, you know, where your audience is, is, is where you need to go. Right. And that that's more for business stuff. If yeah. it's more of a challenging spec ops world job, you really have to understand the phases to prepare because preparation is key. Yeah. You got to get to the training by passing a fitness test. You got to get through the training by crushing events that, you know, are coming. I mean, there's no secrets now. I mean, everybody knows you're going to be under a boat. You're going to be on their log PT. You got to run four miles. You got to swim two miles. You got to do obstacle courses. Got to run in sand. I mean, there's no secrets out there, right? So you should be doing that, right? It's yeah. You can't leave it to chance and all of a sudden say, huh, I really suck at treading water. I guess I should have <laughs> treaded water more. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, don't yeah. blow off treading water. Right. It's hard. You know, yeah. people, people blow off treading water all the time and then they spend five minutes and they're starting to really, yeah, you know, feel like they're going underwater here. So anyway, what I'm saying is there's so many things that, that are out there that you can do, but there are ways to get there. There is always somebody who has gone down that path. Watch what they did, you know, see what they did to get there. Um, ask them. You know, mentorship is huge. You know, ask somebody a question about the journey. You know, what are some things that you need to look out for when you're preparing for X? Um, that That's huge. You know, I, I was very fortunate that I had mentors, even though they didn't know they were mentors to me. I just watched them, you know, do yeah. what they were doing. And that was enough for me. Uh, luckily, I was open minded to say, I see what he's doing. I need to do what he's doing if I'm going to get to where he wants to go. Yeah. And you know, that, that is key. That, that is key. If you're, if you're kind of by yourself, the good news is the world of social media is, is out there that can kind of give you access to people that you would never have access to before. However, you also have to realize that we all have opinions, right? Half of what I just told you today on this podcast is my opinion, right? It may not apply directly to someone else. You know, they may need to do something else. I tell people all the time that I have a way to train, not the way to train. Awesome. And that's just that's just the way it is. You know, there's other ways to prepare. There's other ways that may prepare you better. Um, but you know, you're not going to know unless you start finding out, and that requires a broad timeline so you can test some of these things and see where your progress is being made along these sub goals that I mentioned. And then eventually those sub goals will meet the ultimate goal and you're there. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. That was a, an incredible answer. And I feel like oh, one thanks. of the, the big takeaways there was when you're mentioning that thing, you're always thinking about in your head to just go after it. So for everyone listening, 
make sure whatever that thing is for you, you go at it a hundred percent and, and see what happens from there. So uh, Stu, where can people connect with you? I'm going to link um, everything in the show description for you. Yeah. Well, obviously social media, um, Stu Smith fitness. If you search Stu Smith fitness on Facebook or Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, you, you'll find me. Uh, my website is stusmithfitness.com. Um, so that's it. Stu Smith Fitness. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I had a great time listening to you today. And thank you for being mission driven. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Oh.